Welcome to yet another new series here on the Koabana channel. Recently, I mentioned that I was reading a book about lost, abandoned, and no longer existing villages in Japan, which is a topic I've always been interested in. Naturally, the good majority of these stories are absolutely fascinating and provide a great jumping point to delve into even further stories and villages. When I asked if there was an interest in looking at some of these villages on the channel, it was a resounding yes. And so, here we are. But enough about that. To kick things off, this week we're looking at an interesting little village that can still be found today in the mountains of Keihoku in Kyoto Prefecture. At least, the remains of it can be. This tiny little village on Mount Shinadani is fascinating for one small reason. It managed to hold a border war with neighboring villages for over 600 years. This week, we're heading into what is now called Old Hacho Village, or Abandoned Hacho Village. Hacho Village can be found on the Tamba Plateau, surrounded on all four sides by mountains, in what is now part of Ukyo Ward in Kyoto. Although there are no records for when the village first turned into a settlement, we do have records for other trivial matters, such as, you know, a border war with neighbouring villages that went all the way back to the Kamakura era in the 1300s. From around the start of the 14th century, villagers who lived in the area realised just how bountiful the mountains were, particularly the area in and around Hacho. So this, naturally, led to territory disputes. In particular, the villagers from Hacho were constantly at war with the neighbouring Chi and Yuge villages. After all, whoever controlled the land controlled the resources on it. Now, despite this, Hacho village was never a particularly large village, and until its demise, only a small number of people ever lived there at one time. Yes, the mountains were bountiful, and full of enough resources to have a 600-year border war over, but the area was also incredibly remote, and during the winter, full of snow. The type of snow that could cut the village off from the outside world entirely, leaving the villagers to fend for themselves until the snow melted enough for them to leave again. Again, although we don't have precise records for when the Hacho border war began, we do have records from 1601, in which the border war was taken up by the local magistrate's office. The magistrate ruled in Hacho's favour, and, under the eyes of the law, granted them their borders officially. This greatly upset Yuge village, and, it seemed, they stewed on it. They stewed on it for a while. The border war continued, despite the official ruling, and in 1660, almost 60 years later, villagers from Yuge stormed the Hacho area and destroyed their charcoal kilns. Seeing that nothing else was working, the area surrounding Hacho village was then declared off-limits to private citizens in 1682. The area was opened back up in 1701, and a man by the name of Kichi Dayu took over the running of the village. Kichi and five other people built some small huts and started farming and charcoal making in the area, which became the start of the Hacho village that we know today. Three villages from Hacho's old rivals, Yuge village, also started charcoal making in the area, as well as two villages from the nearby Hirokawara village. These men cultivated more and more of the mountains, making the area more livable than before. However, a man by the name of Sasari Ihe then took over management of the village in Kichi's stead. Sasari was poor with money, however, and by 1723, he was greatly behind on his taxes. As a result, the local magistrate's office took over and, once again, declared the area forbidden to inhabit. Then, during the Meiji Restoration, a former samurai by the name of Hara Sobe entered the village and made efforts to allocate and distribute the land and profits equally amongst the households. He also adopted a communal system of harvesting that was shared equally amongst all villages. And, what do you know, all these hundreds of years later, the border dispute with other nearby villages, particularly Yuge, 
was still ongoing. It was such a problem that the government once again had to officially step in and declare each village's borders. And in 1876, Hacho village's borders were, once and for all, officially decided in the eyes of the law. At this point, the village consisted of five houses with five families. And two years later, lines were drawn up, separating it from Yuge and Sasadi villages. And it was here, finally, that the border disputes came to an end. Hacho village flourished after that, establishing their own shrine and even school in the village. The village itself also grew, perhaps thanks to the fact they no longer had to fight nearby villages constantly for their lands. However, the fact that this village is here, and part of our Lost Villages series, should be enough to let you know that it wasn't to be. From 1924 to 1925, half the village's households moved away due to economic and environmental reasons. As I stated earlier, Hacho village suffered from particularly harsh winters, and it was, ultimately, these winters that would be its downfall. It was in 1933 that Hacho would face its toughest test yet, and it was during this winter that over three metres of snow fell, burying the village. This snow lasted for days, and cut off not only any way of escape, but any potential help trying to come into the village as well. The villagers, holed up in their homes, quickly ran out of food and were unable to get their sick the help they needed as well. They reached, quite literally, the point of life or death, and the needle seemed to be pointing towards death. Of the villagers that did die, their bodies were left unattended for three days as nobody was able to get in or out of the village. Three whole days, the surviving villagers had to spend with the corpses of their loved ones before the snow finally melted enough to allow them to leave. After that, the remaining villagers fled the village one after another, and by 1936, only one house remained. This final family lived alone in Hacho for the next five years, and then, in 1941, they too moved out. In modern times, the risk of living in such a dangerous area, entirely cut off from help, simply outweighed everything else. Hacho was abandoned, and officially, no more. Now, while Hacho village no longer exists as a place where people live today, the remains of the village are still around, and because of its location, the village is now a popular landmark on hiking trails in the area you can still see the remains of a stone fence, some building foundations, and the old shrine gate that still stands today. Beyond a small set of stone stairs, you can even find a small shrine that various hikers visit while on their way. In addition, in recent years a new building was constructed in the village, a type of steel pyramid that is oddly out of place so far out in the mountains. This tiny, rusty building is said to be where a caretaker resides for roughly a month of each year during early spring. Why? Well, this is the season that sees the most hikers, so it's safer to have someone on hand in case something happens than not. You can visit this strange pyramid on Google Maps if you want to take a quick look around. Kyoto University also built a small research hut in the village after it was abandoned, but it has since been torn down. Despite fading out of existence over 80 years ago now, Hacho Village still lives on in people's memories, thanks to not just its location on a popular modern hiking route, but for the fact that, for over 600 years, it had constant border wars with neighbouring villages. A terribly long skirmish, now immortalised on the plaque in front of the village's abandoned remains. But what did you guys think about this one? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you again next time.